here we're going to take a look at how to do a discounted cash flow valuation. So this is a fundamental valuation and it's using the forecast cash flows of a firm, discounting them back to today using the cost of capital. We're going to do it for a real company and using our Felix platform, which includes all the information that you need to do that. So we're going to calculate free cash flows using the consensus estimates and we're going to use Felix cost of capital to discount those cash flows back to today, calculate an enterprise value, and then cross the bridge from enterprise value to equity value and come up with an implied share price. Okay, let's get started. We're going to do a WAC calculation for Kellogg using our Felix platform. Let's take a look at Felix first. So in Felix, we've got a search box for company analytics. I'll type the first letter of Kellogg and you can see all the companies with starting with letter K pop up and I'm going to choose Kellogg Co. And here we've got a whole load of information about Kellogg, but critically on the right hand side, we have got our WAC calculation and we've got a number of options here. We can choose the different um, bond yield for our risk-free rate, 10 year or 20 year. There is one large bank on Wall Street who uses the 20 year, but most banks do tend to use the 10 year. So I'm going to start with that. Then we can calculate the risk premium a number of different ways. We can choose a 10 year risk premium, which is much higher, a 20 year risk premium, or a 30 year risk premium. So that's just taking the return on the stock market versus the return on the 10 year government bond over that particular time period. And we've got a survey of the major Wall Street banks and that comes up as 6.08%. Um, we can also use an implied that, use, that uses the Gordon growth model as the implied rate of return. And we can also put a custom one in ourselves as well. And it will remember that. But I'm going to choose the survey, which is 6.08. We've got a beta there. And we'd expect someone like Kellogg, which has a very stable business, to have a lower beta than their overall market. The market has a beta of one. We'd expect Kellogg, which is breakfast cereal, very recession proof to be lower than one. So that can all be factored into the cost of equity of 5.06%. And then we've got a credit spread and a cost of debt, which just takes the 10-year government bond and adds it to the credit spread. We've got a muted rating of BAA2 and then a leverage ratio of debt to capitalization, which is debt plus equity at 25%. I'm going to copy that and then go back to Excel. So I'm going to paste the information that we pulled from Felix here. And I'm going to do the calculations myself. So rather than just having a pre-calculated cost of equity, I don't need the unlevered beta. So I'm just going to take that out. I'm going to make that a blue number and I'm going to make it a percentage as well. And then what I want to do for the WAC calculation, I'm going to calculate that. So let me just review how we do this. So we'll take our risk free rate, which we're using the 10 year government bond here. And then we will add the equity risk premium and we use the survey of the major banks and we'll multiply the equity risk premium by the adjusted beta. And the adjusted beta is just adjusted for the rule of thirds. So it's a statistical adjustment because large numbers trend towards the mean. And that means our cost of equity for Kellogg is going to be less than the cost of equity for the market because the beta is 0.6. Now, in order to do our WAC calculation, because we have a tax yield on interest, I'm just going to insert a row and I'm going to put the marginal tax rate down here. Now for the marginal tax rate, if we go back to Felix, you can see that we do have the corporate tax rate here, which is the US corporate tax rate. But what I want to do is I actually want to get the corporate tax rate plus the state taxes, because in the United States, we also have a state tax level for corporates as well as a federal level. So if I go to the 10K here, and it takes me directly to the SEC filing, and I click on the sections here, what I can do is then choose in the notes of financial statements, the tax notes. I'm just going to go to income taxes. And if I go down to this little table, you can see we've got the statutory rate of 21%. But then we've also got the state income taxes of 1.8%. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back to my Excel. I'm going to put in the 21% federal tax rate. And then I'm going to add the 1.8% rate. 
and let me just format that as blue and as a percentage. And now what I'm going to do is calculate the cost of debt. We start with the benchmark 10 year government bond rate, and then I'm gonna add the credit spread to that. And that gives me my 2.65% as my cost of debt. Now I'm ready to do my WAC. And there are two parts of the WAC. One is to take my cost of equity financing, which is 5.09%, but I'm gonna weight that by the amount of financing that the equity is providing. So I'm gonna multiply it by one minus that 25.1% because that is the amount of debt financing, capitalization is debt plus equity. So one minus that, the 75% or 74.9% is the amount of equity financing. And then I'm gonna add that to the cost of debt that I've just calculated, but I get a tax yield on debt. And in my free cash flows, I don't pick up the tax shield on interest because I have free cash flow, the unlevered free cash flow. And so that picks up my tax shield in the WAC calculation. And then what I'm going to do is multiply it by the amount of financing the debt providers are providing. And that gives me a cost of capital of 4.33%. Easily done using Felix. So now we're going to do a discounted cash flow of Kellogg. And we're gonna start by calculating the free cash flows. So I come to Felix, and if I just go back to the front of Felix to get into the company page, I'm gonna type the letter K, and it pulls up the list of companies called, we're well, beginning with K, and then I choose Kellogg, and I come to the Kellogg page. But what I'm going to do now is I'm gonna go down to the very bottom, and you can see we've got the consensus estimates of the research analysts who are covering Kellogg, over the next three years. Mostly, the longest period you will get consensus estimates for are three years, because that's usually how far analysts go out. Occasionally, you'll get year four and year five, but if you take year four and year five, often the trajectory of the earnings is not very stable because the number of analysts forecasting beyond three years is very, very little. So you go from maybe 10 analysts forecasting the first three years to maybe two analysts forecasting the latter two years. So it tends to be a bit bumpy. So I'm only gonna take the three years of consensus estimates. I'm gonna copy that, go to Excel, and we've got our RAC calculation there. And I'm gonna go down to my DCF, and I'm just gonna paste in the information. I need to do a little bit of formatting here. Just right align that. I'm actually gonna take out, this is the last 12 months numbers. I don't really, need that. So I'm just going to remove that. I've just selected the column and then removed it. Um, and I do need to do a little bit of formatting here. Um, I'm going to choose the percent there. And that should be a calculation. That's a forecast. Let me just undo that. There we go. So again, that's a hard number. So let me just make that a hard number. And then this should be an absolute number. Just move that there, there we go. And then the margin should be a percentage as well. So I'm gonna make that a percentage and I'm also gonna make that hard-coded too. And then the EPS, I actually don't need the EPS, so I'm just gonna remove that line, anything to make my life more simple. So then what I'm going to do is I'm gonna pull in, I need some other numbers, and I'm gonna pull in the capital expenditure, CapEx, um, the depreciation, and the amortization, okay? And then we're also going to pull in the operating working capital too. And then I'm gonna pull in the long-term effective tax rate. There we go. So I've done that. So then what I'm going to do is I'm gonna pull in the historical numbers for capital expenditure, depreciation, and amortization and operating working capital. So I'm gonna go back to Felix and I'm gonna come up to the click through for the 10K. And when I do that, I'm going to go to my section menu and I'm gonna to go to the financial statements because I want to get to the cash flow statement. And I'm gonna go down and select the statement of cash flows. Um, and that's mistagged um, because of the XPRL tagging is not correct. Um, and so I'm gonna go down and it says 
CapEx Additions to Properties 505. So it's a little bit of a weird name, but I'm going to type 505 in there and then make that blue because that is a hard number. And then depreciation and amortization. Now, in the cash flow statement, they're lumping depreciation and amortization together, which is pretty normal. So let me just put that number in first, that 479 number. And I know that's a combination, but what I want to then do is strip out the amortization. So I'm going to go back to my notes if I come up to the top and then go to the notes of financial statements and I'm looking for intangibles. There we go. And hopefully they'll have a little breakdown. Yep, they've got the amortization here and the total amortization in that year 2021 or January 2nd, 2021 is 27. So I'm going to come back and for my amortization, I'm going to put 27 down. And then for depreciation, I'm just going to take that depreciation and amortization and then just subtract out the 27. So I just get depreciation. Now, for the opening working capital, this becomes a little bit more tricky. So let me just split my screen between Felix and Excel. And what I want to do is I want to go to the balance sheet. So let me just go to the financial statements and I want to go to the consolidated balance sheet. And I'm going to start up at the top and my operating working capital. I'm going to pull in the accounts receivable. So I'll start with the 1537 of the accounts receivable, add the inventories of 1284, add the other current assets of 226. And then I'm going to subtract the accounts payable of 2471. I'm going to subtract the accrued advertising and promotions 776 and then other current liabilities. Now I'm leaving out cash because it's a financial asset. I'm leaving out debt. So that's the current maturities of long-term debt, notes payable, which is commercial paper, and the lease liabilities. And the reason I'm leaving out the lease liabilities is that my EBIT number includes operating lease expense on the US GAAP. So therefore I've got to either subtract it out of the EBIT number and remove it, and then treat the operating leases as debt, or I can just leave it in and ignore them. And I'm going to choose the latter option because that's more common. So that means if I hit enter, I've got 1345 as my operating working capital. And then I want to choose a long-term effective tax rate. Now here, what I'm going to do, if I go to the notes, I'm gonna go down to the tax note. A lot of bankers, there's a little bit of debate about what tax rate you should use in a DCF, but commonly people use the corporate tax rate. And I guess it's a couple of reasons. Firstly, they think that over time, the company's tax rate will gravitate to the effective tax rate will gravitate to the corporate tax rate. And secondly, if you want to repatriate earnings to the home country to get the cash, then you will have to pay a step up from the foreign taxes to the home country taxes. So that's what I'm going to do here. And I'll take 21% and then I'll add the state taxes of 1.8% to, and then hit enter, and just format that as a percent. Now I've got to do a little bit of a cleanup now. So I've got my 22%, and then I'm going to do some forecasting. So I'm gonna come down here and I'll just type assumptions in here. And the assumptions I'm going to put down are gonna be revenue growth, and then my EBITDA margin, CapEx as percent of sales, amortization, just as a dollar amount, because I'll keep that flat, and then depreciation as a percent of CapEx, and then operating working capital as a percent of sales. So for the revenue growth, I've actually, for this, for the historical years and the projected years, I've actually got that because that was in Felix already. So I might as well just pull those in for those years. But then what I've got to do is I've got to make an assumption going forward. Let me just fix my um, panes there just so we can see which year we're in. So if I come down to the assumptions and I'm just going to keep it for simplicity at 1.4. Now I just need to forecast out these dates. So I'm going to do another two years because I want a five-year forecast. So that's 23. 
estimated and we're going to go to 24 and 25 and you probably could just change this to forecast because now we're forecasting rather than just using estimates and I'm going to go down and I'm going to make an assumption that we're going to do 1.4 percent let me just copy that and then type over it 1.4 make it blue and then copy that right and then the EBITDA margin again we have the numbers if I come up to the Felix stats format that as a percentage copy that right but again in those last two years I need to make an assumption and it's pretty flat so I'll just make it as 16.2 percent for the last two years and I can kind of fill in the gaps and then capex as a percent of sales well I need to use my capex number that I've just put in divide that by the sales number and that's rather horrid spelling error so let me just change that I can't bear that it's one thing that's always a little trick is to make sure you just do a check and then I'm going to format that let me go all the way down there we go that's going to be a percentage now we only have that percentage in one year because if I copy that right remember I don't have capex in that year so I'm going to make an assumption and for simplicity I'm just going to assume that capex remains the same percent of sales 3.7 percent and I'll do that for the rest of the period so that is a bit of forecast in there amortization this is just a, a reference a set amount the 27 million so let me go and get that and I just need to format that normally so hopefully that will take it there we go and then again what I need to do is type that in as an assumption and copy that across for the five years and then I've got depreciation as a percent of capex so I'm going to go and get my depreciation number and I'm just going to divide that by my capital expenditure number that I've got up above here format that as a percentage and again I'm just going to make an assumption keep it flat because Kellogg pretty much is in a steady state already so I don't need to worry too much about those assumptions last but not least operating working capital I'll do that as a percent of sales we normally do operating working capital as a percent of sales because it's so heavily linked to the day-to-day -day operations of the business so then I'm going to go up and get revenue and in the historical year this was 9.8 percent again we only have that for one year so I'll just do minus 9.8 percent and then I'm going to copy that across the rest of the forecast so I've got all my assumptions there we go and back to normal and then I'm going to fill in the gaps so for my sales forecast I'm going to take the assumption plus one I always like to do the assumption first it's kind of good practice and then sorry I'm lying it's black it's blue so I'll make it black and then the growth you can actually calculate a growth now it's always good to put these numbers in because in a presentation people always like to see the numbers continue and then EBITDA we have a margin assumption so I'll take that assumption times the revenue that we've just forecast and then again what we can do is just calculate the margin take EBITDA divided by revenues copy that right and then I'm going to pull in well forecast in the capital expenditure go and take the assumption which is a percentage of the sales number so I'm going to get that depreciation go down and get the assumption for depreciation which is the percentage of capex that I've just calculated amortization nice and simple it's just a straight reference operating working capital is a percentage of sales so I'm just going to multiply that by sales go up and get revenues there we go and what I'm going to do is I'm just going to make that a flat line assumption the tax rate so let me copy this right across the forecast now I'm ready to do my free cash flows so I'm going to come down and do my free cash flows let me just format that as a heading and I'm going to start by calculating my EBIT number so EBIT we do have our EBIT 
EBITDA number. So if I come up and get my EBITDA, and then what I can do is subtract out the amortization and then subtract out the depreciation. I could have taken them both from there. There we go. So that's my EBIT number. And then I can calculate something called NOPAT, the op net operating profit after tax, also known as EBAT, earnings before interest after tax, or unlevered net income. If I just put NI just so it fits on that line. All those numbers, or all those names, sorry, are used in Wall Street. So in this case, this is simply my EBIT number times one minus the tax rate. It's essentially if you had no interest income or expense, close parentheses and hit enter, and that's my NOPAT number. Now, generally speaking, you're not really going to do this in the historical year. So I'm only going to do the EBIT and NOPAT in the historical year. And then what I'm going to do is add back the non-cash expenses, and that's going to be my depreciation and adding back my amortization as well. Okay, those are the two non-cash items. Again, I'm just going to do this in 21. So I'm going to go down and get my forecast for depreciation, my forecast for amortization there. So I've added back the non-cash items, but then I need to replace this with the CapEx number or the capital expenditure. So I'm going to go up to my capital expenditure assumption and I'm going to make sure that's negative by multiplying by minus one. I've got my capex. And then I've got to do the increase, decrease in operating working capital. And under every single accounting rule you'll ever do, you always want to take the historical year minus the current year for operating working capital. So I'm going to go up and get my operating working capital in the prior year. And I'm going to subtract it from the operating working capital in the current year. And in this case, it's a cash inflow. This is unusual, but this is because Kellogg has a negative operating working capital. So essentially, there are three components for free cash flows. No pat, your non-cash add backs, and then the investment back into the business. In this case, the capex is an investment, but the operating working capital is actually a release of cash flow. So then I can get my free cash flows, and I'll just sum them up in 2021. And then I can copy this to the end of the forecast. And that's my free cash. Is one check that you should do is you should always compare the NOPAT number with your free cash flow. Certainly by the end of the forecast, your NOPAT number should be higher than your free cash flow. Because what's happening is if you have any growth, what you're doing is you're reinvesting some of the NOPAT back into the business to support that growth. But that is our free cash flow forecast for Kellogg. We have our free cash flows the Kellogg. Now what we're going to do is we're going to do some discounting and that will bring the valuation to a close. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to put some assumptions for our terminal value because we've forecast Kellogg here from 2021 through to 2025. And what we want to do is we want to value the business beyond 2025. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull in a long-term growth rate. And that's just going to be an assumption. And then my weighted average cost of capital. And I'm going to put these in the historical year. Now, for the long-term growth rate, it's always useful to look at your assumption for the growth in revenues in the final year. And you can see it trends to 1.4%. And you should make sure that your long-term growth rate is consistent with the last year's growth rate in the forecast. So I'm going to use that 1.4%. And I'm going to come down here. And I'm going to make that as my assumption for my long-term growth rate. So I'm just going to type that in 1.4% and make sure I get my formatting right. Let me just make that a percentage. Also, it's hard-coded to... And then for my weighted average cost of capital, I'm going to go back to my prior calculated WAC of 4.33%, which is actually very, very low. But it is what the market is using at the moment. Let me just increase the decimals slightly so it's super clear. And then what I can do is calculate my terminal 
value. Now, I like to do this in the last year in the forecast. So what this means, I can't use the 2025 free cash flow. I actually need to use the 2026 free cash flow. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the free cash flow in 2025 and then multiply it by one plus that long-term growth rate. And then I'm going to divide it by the weighted average cost of capital minus the long-term growth rate. And this is known as the Gordon Growth Model. It's essentially a cash flow projecting methodology. And I get a pretty enormous 50 billion there for my terminal value. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to discount this back to today. So I'm going to put an assumption in for power. So I'll take my first forecast year, which is the 2021 year. I'm going to hard code that and then I'll just do that plus one. So this is going to be the power in my discounting formula. And then I'm going to calculate my discount factor. And people like to use discount factors because it's a very clear way of describing your discounting. And I'm going to calculate the factor by doing one divided by, open parentheses, one plus my WAC calculation, absolute reference, close parentheses, to the power of my power above. And I can format that as a percentage. Now, in this case, this assumes that the cash flows are falling at the end of the year, so one, two, three, four, five. But what we can do is we can change that to 0.5, which effectively assumes that the cash flows fall in the middle of the year. And that's pretty normal because companies generate cash every single day they operate. So cash is generated gradually through the year, some at the beginning, some at the end, but on average in the middle. So then I'm going to copy this right, and that's my discounting factor. So what this means is a dollar of cash generated in 2025 is worth 82.7 cents in today's money. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to present value of free cash flows of the forecast cash flows here. And this is pretty straightforward. I'm just going to take the power or the discount factor and I'm going to multiply that discount factor by the free cash flow in the year. And then I'm going to copy that right. I've got a few two decimal places there, so let me reduce that. So that's the present value of my free cash flows. And then I'm going to sum that up and get the total present value of the free cash flows over that forecast period. And that's just a simple sum. So I'm going to sum up those five years worth of cash flows. So that's the value of owning Kellogg over that five year period. And then what I'm also going to do is I'm going to calculate the present value of the terminal value. And the present value of the terminal value, because I've used a Gordon growth method, which is a cash flow method, all I need to do is to take the discount factor in the final year and multiply that by the terminal value that I've calculated in the final year as well. And that will bring that value back to today. So we've got a pretty enormous value for Kellogg. And if I sum that up, I'll get the implied enterprise value here. So I'm just going to sum that up and I've got about 48 billion. Now I can compare that to where Kellogg is currently trading. And if I go to Felix, just type in the letter K and then go to the Kellogg, I can see in my equity to enterprise value bridge, we get an enterprise value of about $30 billion. Whereas I get 48 billion. That's an enormous difference. Now we often would expect the DCF methodology to be higher than the trade in market cap, but that's extreme. And I think part of it is my whack is a little bit low. And sometimes you can be a bit cynical about a banker coming in saying, oh, I think that whack is too low. But the reality is the banker who's advised, who's advised on the last 10 transactions in the sector does know probably better than anybody what the whack should be. Now, I'm going to keep that whack. But the other thing I could do is I could actually make the assumption that my revenues are not going to grow quite as fast into perpetuity. So if I make that final year 0% for my revenue growth, and then I go down to my terminal value calculation, and I also make my terminal value growth 0%, 
then you can see actually we're getting much closer to the current enterprise value. So that's 33 billion in our DCF model compared to 29 billion. That's probably a more normal relationship that I would expect. So I think probably our WAC is a little low. And certainly if I change some of these assumptions here, if I made it a 20 year government bond yield and I did an implied cost of capital, I get a cost of capital of 4.77. So it's materially larger. But probably what this means is, is that the market is expecting Kellogg to be in kind of long term decline in real terms because the revenues are flatlining. Basically, the market is not pricing in more value. So I could put those growth rates back, but then come back. And if I change my WAC risk-free rate, so that's 1.85%. So 1.85, and that's a 20-year risk rate, which one large bank does. And I use the implied, using the Gordon Growth Model to get the implied risk premium, just resolving that formula. I get 6.41%. So if I type 6.41%, and then I go back to my DCF. Let's see what happens to my value now. And I get 40 billion. That's actually closer, but it's still not that close. So it does look like the market is not pricing in any kind of real growth to Kellogg. Let me just put back those assumptions to back to where they were, that 4.33%. And we get the 48 billion. Here we've got an implied enterprise value for Kellogg using the DCF methodology. Now, what I want to do is I want to cross a bridge from enterprise value to equity value. So I'm going to calculate the equity value now. And um, in my little forecast here, I've got my 2021 estimate. So I'm just going to use the balance sheet as at 2020. And now what I'm going to do is cross the bridge and I'm going to go to Felix. And you can see here in Felix, I've got all the information that I need. Um, but this includes the latest filing. So this will be as at the 10Q filing because we are in December 2021. But for simplicity, I'm doing the DCF valuation to the beginning of 2021. So I'm actually going to go to the 10K filing here. And I'm going to pull in the numbers individually. So I'm going to start with the balance sheet. So I'm just going to go to the sections here. And I'm going to choose the financial statements. And I'm going to go to the consolidated balance sheet. So I'm just going to move that over and then go to Excel. So the first thing I'm going to do is I want to add any of the financial assets to the enterprise value. So I'm going to start with cash. I'm going to add the value of cash there, which is 435. And then I'm going to add any investments. And in this case, we've got investments in unconsolidated subsidiaries of 391. You just always meant to make sure that if you are including the investments in your bridge, you don't include the return on the investments in your EBITDA or in no PAT calculation above, because that will be inconsistent. So I've added the two financial assets. And then what I want to do is I want to subtract any financial liabilities. So I'm just going to take the debt number and I'm going to take total debt here. So I'm going to take the 627 for the current maturity of long term debt, then the notes payable, which is debt as well. I'm not going to take the current operating lease liabilities because I've included the rent expense in my NOPAT, which means it's baked into the free cash flows. So I'll be double counting if I then put them into my bridge as well. And under US GAAP, they put the rent expense as part of cost of goods sold and SGNA costs. So we generally in US GAAP will not put them to the DCF. Under IFRS, because they're expensed as part of interest and depreciation, they're not in the free cash flows, in which case you would put them in the bridge, which I know is messy and confusing, but such is life. So I'm gonna ignore the current operating lease liabilities, but then I'm gonna go down and I'm gonna see if we've got any long-term debt. Yes, we do. And I'm gonna pull in the long-term debt, which is 
6746. And then I've also got a pension liability, but rather than take it from the balance sheet, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to the notes to the financial statements because it's always better to take it from the notes. And I'm going to go down and I'm going to look for the um, pension and post retirement benefits. And we want the funded status here. So I'm going to put the pension liability, pension, and other post employment benefit liability. And I'm going to do this in one calculation. So the funded status here is 334. That's for the pension. What you always want to check is whether there are any OPEBs as well. So that's just the Let's see if they include OPEBs. No, they all seem to lump it in one item, which actually is great. That's nice. So that's all in one item. So that's 334. But what I should also do is I should tax adjust this. And I should use the marginal rate to do that. So I'm just going to get rid of that parentheses and then multiply that by 1 minus the tax rate. And the reason I'm multiplying by 1 minus the tax rate is that this reflects the amount that you would have to pay because when you make a contribution to the pension you also get a tax deduction at that point so i'm just going to take this long-term effective rate which is the same as the marginal tax rate in our model and that gives me my pension and opeb liability there and we've done our debt and then i can calculate the implied equity value. So here I'm going to take my implied enterprise value from above. I'm going to add the cash. I'm going to add the investments because they are not including the operations. But then I'm going to subtract the debt and I'm going to subtract the pension and OPEB liability after tax. And that will give me my implied equity value of about 41 billion. But we've still not finished because what we need to do now is we need to cross the bridge to the share price. So I'm going to start with the shares outstanding. And the shares outstanding is always going to be in the front page of the filing. So I'm going to come up to the front page of the filing and cover page. And down at the bottom on the front page, you can see that we will have the number of shares which is there and that's always more recent than the actual balance sheet date so i'm going to take that paste it in convert it to millions rather than numbers and that gives you me my shares outstanding and then what i need to do is i need to do my rsus the restricted stock units and again, what I'm going to do is go to the notes, the financial statements, and I'm going to come down and I'm going to pull in my stock based compensation. And if I come down a little bit, you should see a little I've got stock options there. And then afterwards, usually we normally have the RSUs. Let me just go down. Um, so, yeah, we've got two types of RSUs. We've got the employee restricted stock units there we go um and oh that's actually 2019 and 2018 so i've just got the employee ones so that's 1736 be careful because that's in thousands so if i go here i'm going to type 1.736 so then what i can do is i can come do a subtotal here because what this represents this is kind of the pre stock option share price. So I'm going to do pre including the stock option share price. You can actually make this iterative, but it's easier to do it this way. So I'm just going to take my implied equity value. I don't need that parenthesis. Divided by the sum of the shares outstanding plus the RSUs. And that is before including the stock options. So now what I'm going to do is get the stock options and I'm in the right place. Because if I come back up here, what I'm looking for is the table. And we've got outstanding or exercisable. The vast majority of Wall Street use outstanding. And let me explain why. 
The exercisable, the ones are actually able to vest right now, but the ones that are still within the vesting periods, in other words, owned by employers, but they can't exercise them, are the non-exercisable. And it's the non-exercisable plus the exercisable which make up the outstanding. Now, some people say, well, only take the outstanding if it's an acquisition. I would disagree with that. The reason is, is that if they are in the money, there's a big incentive for people to stay with the business and convert them. And usually, it's not too long before they will potentially convert. So what we would normally do is, in fact, I actually want to take the 20, um, 20 end, which is up here, is we take the outstanding number and check if they're in the money. Because even though there's 4 million which are not exercisable, if they're in the money, there's such a strong incentive for people to stay with the business, we are assuming that they are baked into the share price dilution. So I'm going to take the outstanding options here. And you can see here they are in millions, which is kind of confusing given the other number was in thousands. So you've got to really have your wits about you. And then what I'm also going to do is put my strike price down. And the strike price here is a 65. And you can see they are in the money. So it's a big incentive to stay with the business if the value was $119. And then I'm going to calculate the net new shares. And there's a little formula here, kind of shortcut formula which is the current share price minus the strike. So that's the profit you make. And divide that by the, well, not the current share price, the pre-option share price, and then multiply by the outstanding options. And then hit enter. Hit enter, and that gives the dilution. Now, what you've got to be slightly careful about is that they can be anti-diluted. What a good thing to do here is wrap this with a max function. So I'm going to type max, open parentheses, and then I'm going to go down to the end of the forecast, or the end of the formula, sorry, and type all zero. So that just compares the number to zero. And if it's negative, obviously, it will take zero. So now what we can do is we can get the fully diluted shares outstanding. And that's taking the shares outstanding that we calculated previously adding in the RSUs, the 1.7 million RSUs, and then add in the net new shares above. So I get 352 million fully diluted shares, and then the fully diluted implied share price is just that equity value divided by those fully diluted shares. So I'm gonna go up and get the equity value now, the 41 billion, which is very high, and divide by the fully diluted shares. So we get an implied share price of 117.4 compared with the current share price of 64. Now, sometimes it's kind of worth just seeing what's happened to the share price over time. So if I just click on that and I go back historically, what we can see here is we've got the date and the value. So if I go, this is five years worth, and you can see that over the past year, no, it hasn't really changed that much. So I th think that if you're looking at, you know, why is this? Why is this value so high? It's really to do what, with what the market is valuing the growth to be. And if I go back and make my long-term growth rate 0% for my terminal value, let me just go back up for that, make that 0%, and then also make my forecast 0%, then actually we get to a value for Kellogg, which is pretty darn close to the current valuation at $75 compared to the current share price of 64 bucks. And that would be a normal relationship we would normally expect to see in the discounted cash flow. So I think our WAC is a little low, but I also think that the market is pricing in that Kellogg is a super low growth stock and actually in real terms declining because that's kind of how we get to the implied share price. So that's our discounted cash flow for Kellogg.